The next generation of extremely large telescopes is currently being planned and constructed. The lineup includes the giant Magellan Telescope, an optical and near infrared telescope currently being built as part of the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. When finished, its primary mirror will consist of seven of the largest mirrors on the planet each over eight meters in diameter. Oh, and when it observes bright objects, it won't produce any of those pesky diffraction spikes that every other telescope has to deal with. The GMT is being built as part of the US extremely large telescope program at a cost of about a billion dollars. It will sit 2,500 meters above the Atacama Desert where the weather is almost always clear and the atmosphere is very stable, leading to incredibly good conditions for taking great astronomical observations. This mountain range is also home to the regular Magellan telescopes, which are a pair of 6.5 meter telescopes, but they aren't giant like this new one will be, so we don't need to talk about them today. The GMT will have a segmented primary mirror that has a diameter of 25.448 meters. Of course, segmented mirrors are all the rage after the success of JWST, but since we aren't launching GMT into space, it can be way bigger. Each of the seven segments that will make up GMT have a diameter of 8.4 meters, and in total, the light collecting area will be 368 square meters. This makes these some of the largest mirrors on Earth, and it becomes almost impossible to make larger glass mirrors because they start to collapse under their own weight and stresses if they get much bigger. Just to put this in perspective, each one of those seven mirrors is larger than the total mirror side of all of JWST segments. And this means GMT will have four times the resolving power of JWST and 10 times the power of Hubble. Making and polishing these mirrors to the exact shapes they need to be is incredibly difficult and time consuming and takes several years to finish each one of them. At the time I'm filming this, three of the mirrors are completed and the central mirror is receiving the final polishing. Two more have been cast, but not yet polished, and the final two are yet to be started. This number actually includes a spare mirror as well that can be swapped in and out when the other ones need to be cleaned, repolished, or recoated. The mirrors will be laid out with one in the center and six surrounding it, positioned perfectly to focus the light it receives onto the 1.1 meter secondary mirror, which itself will be made of seven segments, and these will be actively deformable to correct for atmospheric distortions of the incoming light. The good news is that observations from the telescope will actually begin with just four of the mirrors completed, and the final three will be added in as they get completed, meaning that the first observations are actually expected in about 2029 or so. It will look at the first galaxies and stars, as well as the areas around black holes, helping us understand how the universe has evolved through time. Galaxies will be imaged up to 10 billion light years away and will even be able to measure their rotation curves, measure galactic outflows of gas and dust, and look for star forming regions and the clues of ionized gas. It should also be able to directly image some exoplanets. Jupiter sized planets should be visible out to about 300 light years and planets the size of Proxima b out to about 30 light years. That includes, of course, Proxima b itself. GMT will target many similar things to JWST, including the center of the Milky Way, but with better resolution and a different wavelength range. Perhaps the most interesting part of the telescope though, at least before we see images from it, is an engineering decision that will improve those images. Other upcoming telescopes, like the 30 meter telescope or the extremely large telescope, yeah, that's its official name, will end up being larger than GMT, but they will all have to deal with diffraction spikes in their images, which is something that GMT has a unique way around and won't produce any of. These spikes are generally caused by two things. The first is the shape of the mirrors, but the much more impactful factor is the struts that are needed to hold the secondary mirror in place. They usually get in the way of incoming light, diffracting it and causing these spiky artifacts in images. They can be useful for us for identifying which telescope images have come from. For example, all JWST images famously have six big diffraction spikes, which we can use to identify images from that telescope. If you want the nitty gritty details of how the struts cause the spikes, then I have a full video all about that. So feel free to give that a watch, but be sure to come back and finish this one afterwards. 
Technically, there's actually a whole type of telescopes that don't produce diffraction spikes already. So why is this a big deal? Well, the ones that don't produce spikes are called refraction telescopes, and they don't rely on mirrors at all, so they have no need for the struts that cause the spikes. Instead, these telescopes focus light using a lens. This means, though, that these telescopes are essentially impossible to make larger than about a meter or so. Producing lenses of high enough quality any bigger than this is just too difficult, and the size and weight of these lenses is also prohibitively large. If these telescopes could be built without collapsing under their own weight, then they'd also be too heavy and cumbersome to do anything useful with. Hence why all modern large telescopes are reflector ones that use mirrors to focus light, and all of those therefore need those troublesome struts. The way that GMT avoids the spikes is by making sure the struts that hold the secondary mirror in place don't block any light that gets collected by the primary mirror. That might sound like an impossible task, but the segmented nature and layout of GMT gives us a unique opportunity to get this right. You see, there are tiny gaps between the mirrors on the outside, so the secondary mirror will be held up by thin spider arms that line up perfectly with these gaps. This means that they block hardly any light that reaches the mirrors, and hence, no spikes. This almost sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. There are still small artifacts in the images. Not spikes, but rings of circular beads known as airy rings will appear in the images. These come from the gaps between the mirrors and also the fact that the spider arms do still block small parts of the central mirror. It turns out that this isn't enough to cause spikes, but it will cause these sort of odd rings. The reason that beads are better than spikes though is that they are way easier to get rid of and basically every image should be able to remove them. They get filled in and removed by simply taking a 15 minute or longer observation. And as the sky rotates overhead, the change in position will remove these rings because they're basically blank spots in the image where the telescope misses light from. The compromise is that there are gaps between the mirrors, meaning that we lose a little bit of collecting area. Effectively, we only have the collecting area that corresponds to a 22.5 meter mirror rather than the 25.4 meter it really is. This can be somewhat compensated for by taking longer exposures, and it will give us the first ever images of stars and other bright objects with incredibly high resolution, but no diffraction spikes blocking anything near those stars. Objects near the stars, of course, can include planets, so we definitely don't want to be missing any of those. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. And since you've made it to the end of the video, if you're new, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.